Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is uh, staying safe and, and healthy. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. This webinar is titled Passive versus Active Video Surveillance at Yale University. It's, a, it's brought to you by Security Magazine and it is sponsored by Accent Distributing, Bold Group, Eagle Eye Network, Everbridge, Hanwha, HID, and Salient Systems. I'm your moderator, I'm Diane Ritchie. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Security Magazine. Today's presenter is Mike Cruz. He's the Physical Security Systems Manager at Yale University Department of Public Safety, and he is graciously um, doing this even though uh, his university is one of the campuses that is closed during this time. So thank you in, in advance uh, to Mike. Uh, don't forget to submit your questions uh, later on in the program. I know he'll answer as many as possible. Just a reminder that today's event is being recorded and archived on securitymagazine.com. So you have a year to view it again and also share it with your, with your colleagues. We're just gonna do a few housekeeping items. One of the first one is a few words from our sponsors. Uh, retail stores, schools, office buildings, and hospitals around the world have installed 3M safety and security window film. Speak to an expert at accent distributing. Bold Group serves the security industry with the most comprehensive array of alarm monitoring and integrated financial management solutions tailored to achieve optimal business performance. Eagle Eye Networks is a leader in cloud video surveillance designed for modern business owners seeking maximum flexibility camera choices and locations. Everbridge's critical event management platform delivers organizational resilience for institutes of higher ed, combining real-time monitoring, situational awareness, and integrated response and collaboration from a single enterprise-wide view. Hanwha Techwin's VMS WiseNet Wave works with WiseNet X-Series cameras to empower users to leverage the advanced features in sound classification analytics that can detect abnormal sounds. Visit hanwasecurity.com forward slash wave. HID Global powers the trusted identities of the world's people, places, and things. Millions of people globally use HID products and services to navigate their everyday lives. For more information, visit hidglobal.com. Schools and universities across the country have trusted Salient's powerful Complete View 2020 VMS software to keep their campuses safe and to provide real-time actionable information. Thank you to all those sponsors. One last housekeeping item. Um, this presentation is protected by U.S. and interna international copyright laws. Reproduction, distribution, display, and use of the presentation without written permission of Mike, our speaker, is prohibited. And uh, the other thing is that we are authorized to um, offer a CEU credit for this program. So um, you, to qualify, you need to watch the webinar for a minimum 45 minutes. And then after that, there will be a um, information to, uh, to answer a question and then download your certificate of, of completion. So, um, and then here are the learning objectives for today's um, webinar to identify when to use ground-based radar with video identification, uh, how to integrate two systems in one cohesive unit, to, to discuss how to respect the historic nature of a building while still protecting it, which is the Yale Bowl that Mike's gonna talk about, and to uh, take a look at best practices when creating an active surveillance system. So thank you everyone for all your patience with those housekeeping items. And now I will turn it over to Mike. Hello, and thank you again for joining us. Uh, I am excited to share with you a project that we just completed at Yale University. Uh, this project was a challenge for many different reason, reasons, uh, whether it was the implementation of new ground bacon technology uh, to preserving the historic nature of our facility. Uh, my goal for today's webinar is that by the end, uh, you will have a better understanding of the product we chose and the reasons of why we chose them. Uh, at the end of the web webinar, I will show you uh, the finished product. I created a video showcasing the entire system in action uh, with its current integration. 
Uh, once again, my name is Michael Cruz. I am the Physical Security Systems Manager uh, for Yale University. I have been in the industry for uh, 14 years now. I started out as a technician and worked my way into system design and project management. My current role uh, is I design and manage uh, the deployment of Yale's physical security products. Um, without further ado, let's get into a passive versus active video surveillance at Yale University. Okay, so let's set the lens. The Yale Bowl. The Yale Bowl opened its doors in 1914 in the city of New Haven, Connecticut. It was the first bowl. Uh, it was the first bowl-shaped stadium in the country, and was the inspiration for other stadiums such as the Rose Bowl, Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, the Michigan Stadium. The bowl itself has 106 years worth of history and tradition. Uh, we've had major bands play here, from the Grateful Dead to the Eagles. It was home to the New York Giants during their 1976-77 season. Um, it was also declared a national monument in 1987 for its role in football history. Uh, one of the things that actually challenges us is that the bowl itself sits about 1.5 miles away from our central campus, and it, and it sits on an 80-acre athletics facility. So the size of the athletic facility and the distance from our campus is one of the challenges that we had to overcome. So, Let's talk about our security assessment. So during our security assessment, we found that there were four key areas that we really needed to address. You know, the first one was, you know, replace uh, the aging video surveillance system that was out there. Uh, at the time, you know, we had a video IQ system uh, working with point-to-point uh, -point wireless. Um, we knew that by having point-to-point -point wireless transmission, uh, we would leave ourselves vulnerable to cyber attack. Uh, we also needed to install new infrastructure. Um, you know, earlier in, uh, we had a project that supplied us a uh, network for this project. Um, the first project was a two-year collaboration between Yale ITS and public safety. Um, this project laid close to two miles worth of fiber to give us the backbone in which we would build this project from. Uh, but now that we had this backbone in place, we still had to lay the groundwork uh, for whatever so, um, solution that we came up with. Um, not only that, but we also had to design a system uh, that could withstand the harsh New England climate. Um, obviously, you know, I don't know if any of you have been to New England during the winter, um, but it's not that pleasant. Uh, so we had to, you know, take into consideration, you know, the, the swift uh, changes in temperature, you know, how are we going to deal with uh, things being uh, not in environmentally sound uh, proof environments, right? Um, we also had to look at uh, how do we provide coverage for our entire mile perimeter. Um, now, the, the, the last piece of the puzzle was to figure out a way to reduce our overall footprint while increasing the coverage area. We knew we wanted to give ELPD the situation awareness on key areas, but also at the same time, let them cover a large area with detail. So, what is the solution? So, after months of research and product demos, we decided our best solution would have to be to combine two systems into one unit. We decided to go with a multi-sensor camera with PTZ capabilities and have that unit controlled by ground radar. Now, how do we tie it all together? We tied it all together. And we were gonna use hardened industrial switches out there because we knew that, that that spec would survive the New England climate. So. Let's take a deep dive into these products and find out for the reasons why we chose them. So when looking at different camera options, we knew we needed to reduce our overall footprint, but at the same time, increase our coverage area. We looked at several different options, but in the end, we decided to go with the Axis Q6000 combined with the Axis Q6125 PTZ for situational awareness and PTZ control. When combining, when choosing the camera locations, we evaluated past camera locations while also studying reports of trouble spots. We knew we wanted to install the Q6125 for overall coverage at strategic locations around the stadium, 
then we would use the combination of the Q61, the Q6000 with the Q6125 for constant surveillance and PTZ control. If you look at the slide in front of you, you'll have numbers going around. So you have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. If you look at one, you can see that it just has a circle with a cone going out. That represents a PTZ. Um, and then as you go around the perimeter, you go to camera number five, you see that it has the circle and it also has two triangle spots. Uh, that actually donates a PTZ with um, the Q6000. So we would have the multi-sensor lenses in there. And what we decided was that we just need to make sure that you know, we got the most coverage, but we also did not put cameras in places where we wouldn't feel that they would actually sit, like, suit the situation. So that's why you have, you know, a few cameras here that have the Q6000 with the 6125 and then other spots that just have the regular um, Q6125 PTZ. So. With the Q6000, you could choose three different lens options. You could either go with a stock 1.37 millimeter lens or opt in for the 6 millimeter lens or the 16 millimeter lens. We use a combination of these lenses. Uh, for this shot, we went with 1.3s for the wider view of the main entrance and a 16 millimeter for the gate, which is approximately 300 feet away. So right now you can see that we're getting a lot of bang for our buck on this shot here. We have four separate lenses, and then we also have a PTZ mixed with this one. Then in this shot, we went with all six millimeter lenses. So fun fact, the stadium was designed without internal bathrooms or concession stands. This gave us a real challenge on how to watch what was going on inside the bowl, while at the same time seeing what was happening by the bathrooms and the concession stands without adding more cameras. Uh, so that's why we went with the Q6000 and the Q6125 here, because we can give situational awareness on what's happening by the bathrooms and the concession stands while not losing focus of what was happening inside the bowl. This, this stands, <clears throat> So it was, you know, one of the things that we always got to worry about is, you know, how many people are going in and out of the bowl during games. And we want to make sure that the PD always had situational awareness of what was going on around the bowl at all times. So another challenge for us was that the interior of the bowl has no lights. There are no stadium lights. Uh, meaning that there's no night games at all. So what this does is that we need to find a way, how do we see in the dark? So what we did was we picked a camera that would have a good IR balance. And the 6125, the PTZ, comes with access optimized IR, which does about 200 meters in the dark. Um, the optimized IR, what that means is that when a camera, um, when the IR actually comes out, and it hits the target, the IR does not just wash the target out. The IR itself, what it does, it adjusts the level of IR depending on the zoom level of the camera. So this shot right here, it was taking about 5.30 in the AM. You can see a person right on the Y, right in the middle of the field there. So some of the things that we like to do is we, we love to demo products. It's a, it's a big thing for us, and it's very important um, that we do demos with products to make sure that they're going to uh, work well in the situation and not just read specs um, from the website. We want to put the cameras in the situation and actually test them out. So working with our partners, what we were able to do was we were able to do a demo of the 6125 um, in place at the bowl. So what I'm going to show you now is a video of that actual demo. Again, this is the 6125. This is taken on top of the Kenny Fieldhouse. You can see the zoom level. And then this is at night, and you'll see the optimized IR in action.
You can see that it illuminates the target but does not wash them out. Again, in virtual darkness. So now, now the question comes in, now we have these cameras that can cover the whole stadium, but only when someone is controlling them. So the question comes in, and some of you may be aware, as you know, with PTZs, it's only worth it when you have someone controlling it. If someone is not in charge of it, in my experience, it is always looking in the wrong direction when an incident occurs. With a campus as large as Yale, I couldn't just dedicate a central alarm station officer to just watch the bull. This is where the SR-250 came in by Magos. The SR-250 is a ground-based radar solution. So the SR-250, what it will allow us to do is utilize the PTZs without having to assign an officer to control them. The SR-250 are always looking for and tracking targets. They work in any weather condition and are not prone to false alarms as some other systems are. By placing the SR in key locations, we could reduce the number of cameras and use the full functionality of the PTZs. If you look at the screen and you see that green outline, that's actually the geofenced area of protection around the bowl. You can look at this and you can see that with each SR location, you would notice from the slide that I showed you earlier is that we have a corresponding PTZ. Now, what this does is that gives us the ability to let the radar be the brains, and let the PTZ be the eyes. So obviously, so this radar itself, the SR-250, can go up to 250 meters. So right now, you can see that we are just caring about where the green, ar green outline is, because that's our area of protection. So as soon as somebody walks into that area, that's when, that's when our, our quesos will get an alarm. Speaking of our quesos, on campus, we have our own fully equipped UL listed central alarm station. In this alarm, in this location, we have three central alarm station officers, so CASOs. They are monitored 24 seven. They are tasked with monitoring all our facilities and responding to various situations on campus. We know that an officer can only monitor so many systems at one time. So it was crucial to design a system that would alert and track the target without the CASO's interaction. So what we did was we married the, the radar system with our access control system. So the MASS software, which is the MAGOS um, software that lets them uh, control the radars, it stands for MAGOS Area Surveillance Software. What that does is that's tied into our symmetry system. And what it does is when it picks up a target, it sends a signal to our alarm monitor. This is a picture of our alarm monitor. For privacy, for just reasons, I actually whited out all the other alarms on the screen just to show you um, exactly what our case would, would see. So an alarm comes in, it tells them that it's one of the areas at the bowl. And then what happens is, when this comes in, our quesos, they go to the alarm, they activate it, and then that would trigger a workflow in the system. Now that workflow, what it does, it lists them through different steps of what to do next. The first step is for them to open up the MASS software, which again is the MAGOS area surveillance software. It's the software that controls the interaction between the radars and the cameras. So what we did was we created a custom overlay. 
so that the responding officers would get as much information as possible. As you can see in the picture above that there's a subject right where it says target with the red arrow, you see the white dot with the cookie cutter, with the cookie crumb trail right behind them. And what that does is it tells you which direction the target is traveling. So in our overlay, we made sure to put a compass, so north, south, east, and west. And we also have all the streets listed with the gates as well, so that the responding officer knows that, hey, a target's been identified, and it, the target is moving towards gate F. So then we always want to give our officers the most information possible when responding to any incident. Then the next step in the workflow would be to bring up the, the actual view and milestone. So what we did was we created a view and milestone. Milestone is our VMS platform that houses our cameras that are always recording. And then it also has an overlay inside it with that mass software. What this does now in this step is they bring up the, map, the milestone software and what they do is they can actually watch and track the target as they move around the bowl. Now, they have to make the call of whether it is a valid target or is it a groundskeeper or is it somebody who is supposed to be there. Now, if the person is found to be a valid target, meaning that somebody that they need to call the police on, the, the Yale PD, they will then call our Yale police dispatchers. They will tell them of what was happening at the bowl. They will confirm that the Yale dispatchers have the target because our Yale dispatchers also have this program. They will confirm that the Yale dispatchers have the target. Once that confirmation takes place, the Yale dispatchers then take control of the PTZs, and then they will dispatch the police and work with the police in order to stop the target. So during, during our research, we demoed other radar units, but with a range of 250 meters, 820 feet, the seamless integration with, with our VMS, our, our milestone system, and the, the integration with our access control system, Symmetry, um, the, the SR250 from Magos was a clear, a clear decision for us. So now that we have, we have the eyes, we have the brains, now we need something to tie it all together. We, now, what we decided to do was we tied it all together with the access um, industrial POE switch. So what we, what we did was, the reason why we tied it with this is because the access industrial switch has a temperature rating of minus 40 and up to 167 degrees Fahrenheit. So with that temperature swing, we knew that it would be able to survive anything that our weather can throw at it. Another key point of this device is that it pumps out 60 watts of POE per port. Now, the, the radar units themselves only require 3.5 watts, which is pretty amazing that th that device can do so much but only require 3.5 watts of power. The cameras themselves, though, require 60 watts of power. So we had to make sure that because we didn't want to introduce a switch and then have an injector. We didn't want to do that. We want to have everything in one little package. So that's why this switch actually suited our needs perfectly. So 60 watts per port, it, it was perfect for us. And it also has two uh, SPF ports because we needed to use fiber. So. So what we did was, now, <clears throat> now earlier when I talked about fiber and I, and I mentioned uh, that we had that fiber backbone that was in place, but we also need to put fiber in order to connect our switches together to get this whole system up and running. 
earlier when I said that it was, you know, the bowl itself was designed without bathrooms or concession stands in, in the actual bowl, that also gave us a challenge of how do you run wires in a place where there's no internal structure? The bowl itself sits on a mound of dirt and cement with tunnels that actually go in through the base, the base of the mound. So if you look where the blue arrow is, that is actually a tunnel. And what happens is that the people go in, they go through the tunnel, they come out, and then they go to their, stand, to their stands. Now, there are many tunnels around the facility so there is no place for us to run wire. So what did we have to do? If you look at the red arrows up top, what we had to do was we actually had to hand trench from, from the starting point where our main fiber connection was all the way around. So what that meant was we had to remove fencing, we had to get in there with shovels, and we had to lay all the conduit inside, and then we had to lay our fiber. All in all, we laid about 2,000 feet of fiber throughout this whole project to get it all together. Now, that was something that, you know, we thought it was just going to be a nightmare, but it, it turned out to be pretty good. It, it wasn't too bad. So right here, here's are some finished shots of, of, our, of our system. This is our Kenny Fieldhouse. This is the main entrance that everybody sees when they come in. So it is very important for us to make sure that the install was clean and we added as little cameras as possible, but give us the same amount of coverage, if not more. If you look, you can see the camera just below the awning there. We have the Q6000 with a 6125. And then right above that, you have four windows there, and then right on the corner is where our radar unit is. So right now, we're covering that whole area with two radar units and two cameras. Here's a picture of an installation on one of our, our, our scoreboards. This is three units here, so you have two radar units and one camera unit up top. The original system had you know, several units with several cameras, with several IR blasters, and the wireless um, receivers and transmitters. So what we wanted to do was make sure we cleaned this all up and only put minimum amount of devices actually on this. Here's a shot of the actual back of the bowl with the 6125 and then one radar unit here. Again, this would not have been you know, possible if it was not for that radar unit controlling this PTZ. I would not get the amount of coverage that I needed. So that's why you know, we had the 6125 with the, the radar unit back there. So some of the things that we learned as we were going through this, you know, it's always important to do, you know, some kind of after action or try to figure out what things you did right, what things you did wrong. Um, you know, one of the things that I feel that we did right uh, was, you know, we, we demoed the cameras on location um, and we make sure to demo it at night. Uh, a lot of people will go and they'll do a camera demo and they won't necessarily do it in the environment that you need it to perform in. So one of the things that I feel personally is we need to know exactly what we're getting uh, and not just rely on, you know, spec sheets or somebody's opinion. I think a demo is, is worth um, its weight in gold. So you know, one of the things that I would definitely recommend uh, when you go with any large project or you end up, you know, deciding to do something like this, I would definitely work with your uh, manufacturer, your vendor, um, and, and get those cameras uh, that you're looking at and, and put them to the test. You know, don't don't take anybody's word for it. Put it to the test um, and, and take the actual time to see what it's going to do. 
Um, another thing that, you know, that I feel uh, that we did well uh, was managing expectations. Uh, it's important uh, to manage expectations of the system. Uh, you need to spell out uh, what the limitations are. You know, for example, you know, we had the Q6000. Uh, you know, the Q6000 does not come with IR or LifeFinder. Um, this meant that at night, we would not have the same coverage on the fixed shots uh, that we do during the day. Um, so, you know, this is something that we knew going into it, and we wanted to make sure that people understood that, you know, during the day, you know, these shots are going to look great, um, but during the night, you know, we're not going to get um, what what we have during today, you know. Um, but this was something that we were willing to deal with um, since we had the radar units controlling the PTZs uh, with its ability to see in the dark. It, it, was, it was one of the sacrifices that we, we were willing to do. Um, so it's also essential to show uh, what your coverage zones are, um, especially when it comes to the radar. You know, you want to make sure that you know that, you know, the, the radar – it's great, but you know it cannot see around objects. So, like if there's a building in the way, uh, and somebody's behind the building, the radar's not going to see them until they get from behind the building. Um, but that's why it's essential to have those conversations up front, um, to do a real site survey, lay it out, and just say, hey, you know, this is exactly what it's going to see, this is what it's not going to see, um, and then decide from there, you know, put it up to your stakeholders and, and show them and, and let them decide whether, you know, we need more cameras here, we need more radar, um, but let them know right from the beginning so that everybody knows at the end of the day, hey, this is exactly what we're protecting and this is what we can't. Um, there's nothing worse than than thinking you're covered, and then all of a sudden you find out that you're really not. Um, that is something where you, you definitely don't want to be in that situation. And then the last point that I really want to go over is you know training, right? Like you know having new state of the art equipment, you know new tech is great, um, but if the people using it on a daily basis uh, don't know how it works, um, it's a waste of money, right? You you got to make sure um, that you get the people involved right from the beginning that you know are going to be living with this product day by day. They're going to use the system. Um, you want to make sure that that training plan is in place, um, that they get the buy-in and that they understand you know how to use it. Uh, you also want to get their feedback on the system. Um, you know, let me give you an example. You know, when we first uh, laid this out. You know, the original overlay uh, for the mass software just had the portal numbers listed and the gates. Um, so the gate names and the portal numbers listed for the bowl, um, which I thought was a great idea. Um, but I'm not a responding police officer. I'm not a dispatcher that has to tell um, an officer who could be possibly going into a dangerous situation, you know, what to do. So, you know, after working with our director of security and our chief of police, you know, it was suggested um, that we put the street names and a compass on the layout. Um, so that's why you see that there now. It wasn't because, you know, I thought about it. No, it was because it was a collaboration um, between our departments to see how we can best utilize this new system, how we can um, give the officer the most advantage that they can have while going into these situations. Because remember, we don't know, you know, what the officer is getting into. You know, it could be raining out there. It could be snowing. You know, we don't know, you know, where, you know, this person is coming from. So we want to make sure that this officer has as much information as possible. That was one thing that, you know, um, going into this, I was thinking of it as, you know, a technician, um, as a system designer. Um, but at the end of it, you know, I really came out of it seeing it more from what my police officers have to deal with and how they have to respond. So it's so important. If I can give you any advice, it would be to work with everybody that's going to have to deal with the system and respond to it. So. That being said, 
what I would like to do now is I would like to show you what the system looks like live. Now, this video is, is the actual integration between the radar units, the cameras, and Milestone. Um, I couldn't show you the, the integration um, with the actual access control and symmetry um, because I just couldn't capture it. But this is, this is a video of our system live and in place. So Diana will open it up for questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, outstanding presentation, very informative. I appreciated the video at the end too. Uh, just a reminder everyone that um, we are going to open it up for questions, but and if we don't get to all of them, please continue to submit them because, like I said earlier, I know that Michael will um, will go ahead and um, answer them them offline. So, um, one question: Does the radar and or the camera highlight on the bowl map which area it detected activity? Yes. So right now uh, we have alarm zones set up. So what happens uh -huh. is you have you have two um, indications. What will happen is the actual area, I showed you earlier the green geofenced outline. Um, each one of those areas actually flash um, as a target moves into it. So not only um, do you have the target, the white dot, and the actual cookie crumb of the travel direction, uh, the direction of travel, but the, the zone itself will flash blue. Okay. Now, that's all programmable, too, so you can program mm -hmm. all that. Okay. Uh, a question, two, couple questions on, on the, the, the radar system. First one is, um, are you getting any false positives um, with that radar system, things like birds, dogs, cats, other wild, wildlife, things like that? Okay, so, so right now, um, we, the, the only false positive that I saw uh, was when, for some reason, I don't know why this happened, but there was a flock of birds just hanging out um, in the stands. It was after a game, so they were going nuts uh, just eating uh -huh. whatever it was there. So it, it, there, that was the only time that I actually saw that. Um, but right now, there is... Um, the, you know they do have an analytic um, that will determine between uh, birds and animals um, and people. Uh, we currently don't have that deployed right now, um, but that is something that we're looking at. But I can tell you, I only had that one instance where the, you know that flock of birds caused it to go off. Other than that, the system's been pretty solid. 
Okay. What about heavy snow or rain? Any does it is it affected by that at all? No, not at all. That's actually one mm-hmm. of the the beauty parts about it um is that, you know, it's not affected by rain or snow um because it's it's just radar. Okay. Um somebody else asked uh how it handles densely populated days like like your like your yeah. game day. Um yeah, are there exactly. any challenges with that? Obviously that would be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so this is this is what we did for game day. Um in the system, you know, we're able to do schedules uh so mm-hmm. that we turn off the radar because during our game days, uh we actually have a command center. Um, which are Yale police, they actually have a facility on site nearby. And what they mm-hmm. do is they actually control the cameras during that time. So the radar units okay. are not active during game day. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, somebody was, let's see, I wanted just to find that question about um, any IT guidelines that may have existed for the deployment of the system. Um, did you use milestone or access hardening guidelines, or did, was that the role of the integrator or maybe uh, your IT team? Can you yeah, that, provide some guidance? Yeah, that was yep. yeah, that was that was more the role of. We have a, a very strong um, partnership with our IT team here. Uh, matter of mm-hmm. fact, we have an entire team that's deployed just to public safety, um, and oh, they're the wow. ones that that's yes, exactly. Um, so we have our own internal. IT team for public safety. Um, so they worry about, you know, all that stuff as far as the, the switches go and, and all that stuff. They take care of that on a daily basis, actually. Okay. Got a couple of questions that came in over uh, regarding drones. Are you using drones? Do you have plans to use drones? Uh, drones as far as drone detec- detection goes? Is that what we're thinking? Well, I right? guess drones for as far as, uh, well, 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 both, I guess. That would, would be a fair yeah, question okay. to ask. Yep. Mm-hmm. So our our PD does have a drone, and they use it um, on certain occasions. Um, so yes, we do we do have a drone. Um, but then, as far as drone detection goes, yes, the system can uh, detect drones. Uh, we have not had e- any incidents uh, with you know drones coming into the stadium or anybody flying it by there. We haven't seen any of that. Um, but the system is prepared for that. Mhm. Mhm. So with regarding the the how you talked a lot about how the the stadium is laid out and you know how it was built and such are there I mean are there plans to I guess upgrade uh how the, the exterior or anything like that um and obviously cuz that would affect all everything that you just did right <laughs> Yeah well you know um one of the things to uh you know upgrading upgrading that bowl it's it's you know, there we can't change the outside. Um, you know, there's certain things you just can't do to a historic site. Uh, so mm-hmm. there hasn't been any discussions to to change anything, to add bathrooms or anything like that. You know, I haven't heard anything along those lines. You know, we do have you know certain projects like we replaced the scoreboard um, and did that kind of stuff. But you know, we really, really try to stay um, with the historic nature of it. So that's why mm-hmm. you know putting minimal cameras up and, and the radar units was, was key to us because we wouldn't disturb um, what it looks like. Okay, okay. Um, somebody uh, wanted to know about um, your standard operating procedure for your security team when an alarm is triggered. And you've also, like you've mentioned, you've got the, um, uh, uh, the city the, the police department, right? On, on site no, for games? Yeah, so so our so our so no, it's okay. So uh, we have Yale PD, uh, which is the uh-huh. Yale Police Department, uh, which is for the university, um, and then we have our security, um, which you know also supplements to the Yale PD. So our our standard operating procedure is that our CASO, which is our central alarm station officer, um, who monitors all of Yale's facilities, cameras, access control, and burglar alarm. Um, what mm-hmm. what happens is when an alarm comes in, their job is to say, hey, you know, this is a valid target at the bowl. Um, and if they determine that it is, you know, part of the process is then they contact the Yale dispatcher, 
um, and they mm -hmm. make sure that the Yale dispatcher has the target, and then they would dispatch the police, the Yale PD. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, there was uh, a couple questions about asking uh, why you didn't do wireless uh, when you went with a fiber option. Oh, why did we go with the fiber option? Yeah, versus yeah, I, I okay, guess wireless. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, we 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 looked at wireless and we had it before. Um we just felt that it would just leave us more vulnerable uh to some kind of cyber attack. Um so we decided, you know, if we we're going to do this, let's actually uh put an infrastructure in a fiber uh backbone that we can grow off in the future and not have to worry about those kind of attacks. I know it seems um in this day and age of you know, using Wi-Fi uh, for certain certain products. You know, it it seems like that's how you should do it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, we thought about it, but you know, fiber was the best way for us. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, uh, what is the infrastructure that carries the signal back to the school or your or your command post? Oh, okay. So it's uh, yeah. we we have we have fiber going all the way through. Yeah. So it's okay. it's fiber from the stadium and then it's fiber all the way back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I think getting back to the MAGOS system, uh, can it track one subject in a crowd? Somebody's asking. Oh, okay. So, so what happens is once the operator uh, takes control of the system, so what happens is let's say you have, you have two people um, the, and they, they're walking side by side. And all of a sudden, they go. One goes left, one goes right. Um, mm -hmm. What the radar unit will do is it will bounce between the two targets and tell the camera to take the widest view possible to catch both targets. Okay. Okay. If okay. the central alarm station officer, if he wants to track an individual person, um, what he does is he goes to that object. Um, what happens is when a target, you saw it in a video, when a target pops up, there's you'll see like a little bounding box. Um, the bounding yeah. box is w once they click that bounding box of that target, um, the radar unit will stay on that target no matter what happens around it. Okay. It doesn't do it just automatically because it wants to watch the whole scene the whole time, but the okay. officer itself, the officer himself can click it and take control. Okay. Okay. All right. That's it. Um, somebody asked, you know, getting back to the infrastructure of the stadium, if you decide to get stadium lights, would that how would that affect your your cameras have you have you guys has, has that been considered you know uh, so right now uh, again there there hasn't been any talk of adding stadium lights there um i really think that is just a design choice of that stadium and that's how they want to keep it um but if they did add stadium lights i, I mean that would only help me right because then you know yeah. the q6000 with its you know with no ir no no uh, light finder um that would just help me so I would I would love stadium lights. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, did did you post uh, signs uh, related to the fact that that uh, the area is under video surveillance? Is that something that was communicated to or is communicated to to folks that enter the stadium? So it is communicated, and you know we do have signs. Um, you know, stating that the the area is under video surveillance. Our whole campus um, has signs like that, so people are are aware of it. Yes. Okay. Um, and then someone was asking why, if there was there any reason that you decided not to use three sixty degree cameras. Uh, yeah. The reason why we want they want to do three sixty degree cameras, um, you know, so with the Q six thousand, um, it actually enables us to actually move the lenses around um so they're not okay. just fixed lenses um we can actually there's a track uh that sits on the inside and we can slide them around and actually change the lenses out um and the height as well uh of the actual cameras we want to make sure um that we had the you know uh lenses that would work from the height um a 360 you know we have them around campus um and they're great for certain applications but we just didn't think it would work for that application Okay. Um, let's see. I want to just remind everybody, we just have a couple minutes left for, for questions, so please continue to to, to send them. Um, and I, like I said, I know we're, he'll get to them um, offline. Um, can Did you mention who the system integrator was in your presentation? I think I might have missed that. No, I did not. 
I did okay. Not. Okay. All right. Um, and then let's see. Does somebody um, want to know, or uh, I mean? Well, yeah, question? a lot of people have been asking. I didn't know if you were oh, comfortable sharing oh, yeah. that information. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely am. Um, StructureWorks is my integrator. StructureWorks. Are they a local yep. company? They they are. They're out in New York. Yep. Okay. And then um, let's see. Somebody was asking about um, were there any specs that you were concerned about when you were laying your fiber, like depth, proximity to power lines other utilities, things of, things of that nature. So when we laid our own, when we laid a fiber, we loaned, laid our own conduit too. So it had its own oh, pathway. You, oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now we hand trenched and laid our own conduit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you did that on your own because what was the reason and just to be able to control, control that? Yeah. Well, well, be able to control it and to have a pathway that is solely ours so that if we want to uh -huh. add anything, you know, it would be that's our pipe, that's our fiber, and we can do what we need to in there. Yeah. It, it, okay. Basically, it was all about future proofing. Um, we know that this system um, is great for us, um, but everybody sure. knows, you know, security needs change, right? So right. we had to make sure that we were setting ourselves up for the future for expansion. Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you very much for your time. That's all we have. Um, thank you very much to Michael Cruz for your presentation. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, Accent Distributing, Bold Group, Eagle Eye Networks, Everbridge, Hanwha, HID, Salient Systems. Um, if, if, if you have any additional questions, please go ahead and, and email, email me. And um, again, this will be uh, archived for a year. Um, everybody, I appreciate your time. Can stay safe, stay healthy, and um, enjoy the rest of your day.